Hi there, it's Alan again and welcome to my channel. You join me for part two of this painting session or, or semi-tutorial. Rather think of it as uh, just a guidance really more than a tutorial. It occurred to me that we haven't spoken about paints. Um, so just as a reminder, where we are at the moment is we've done a black undercoat. Well, we've prepped the figures, done a black undercoat. Uh, I've just done two um, colors of flesh, showed you how to paint the eyes. And I've talked about this concept of inside out painting. And it occurred to me that I haven't really talked about triads and how we're gonna construct the rest of the models. Um, thought I'd show you a few examples of the paints that I use. So here's, here's a foundry sequence. Um, so the foundry paint system, this is the uh, boneyard, which raise, raise, uh, ranges from a sort of light buff through to an off-white. Um, that's one of my favorite triads. I tend to use that for a lot of uh, historically uh, uh, you know, based miniatures where we're looking at you know, effectively uh, white or off-white type clothing. Uh, and that does quite well for you know, Greek tunics or something similar to that. Um, just as another sort of introduction, you can obviously buy triads ready-made. Again, as I say, Foundry's one. These are Reaper paints. This is a red triad that I tend to use quite a bit. Um, and the only thing I would say about with the reds is that it takes quite a bit of um, getting used to in some respects. And quite often, if I want a, an extra layer here, I'll put a, a very distinct highlight. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said for Reaper. They sell their paints in triads, uh, and I find them uh, to be really useful. Um, And then lastly, I was going to talk about making up your own triads because this can actually be more fun than anything else. So here's um, a sequence of Vallejo paints uh, that I tend to use for a brown. Don't know how well rendered that is on the on the screen, but here we've got a eight two two as the base coat. Then we've got a flat brown, a nine eight four, followed by a highlight which is an eight four six, um, and this one is actually. Uh, just a mahogany brown. Now, again, it's a bit of trial and error, but actually that as a dark, mid and highlight works really quite well. And again, I would encourage you to go to the local model shop, pick up some paints that um, that you trust or that you know, and then you know look at them by eye. Sometimes it can be a bit misleading in that you'll tend to go very, um, uh, well, basically I think you, know, you, can, all, you can underestimate the, the, you know, the difference between the paints. And, and convince yourself that it's going to be more distinct than it actually is. So even though this one looks extremely dark, this is only the base coat. This is the one that's going to be the majority of the color. And then we're going to highlight on top. So, I mean, that's just a brown triad that I use. I've got blues, um, greens, uh, yellows even. Whatever you think of, just get yourself down to your local shop. I think it's better to look at them in person because then you can you can make a judgment based on what you see in front of you with your own eyes. If you don't um, have particularly good color differentiation, then the local uh, you know, <coughs> representative at the store should be more than happy to help. Um, and I've found most model shops and equivalent that you go into, uh, people are only too pleased to help. So anyway, um, just thought I'd quickly show you where the, the two foundry paints that we use for the flesh. This is the five series. So we've got a 5A there and a 5B. Um, I'm going to be thinking about a highlight, but only at the end of this process. Um, and I would say that if you get good color differentiation with just two, um, then that's absolutely fine. You shouldn't worry too much about it. Um, back to what we're painting. So we're painting here some Etruscans, and this is the stage that we're at with that face um, pretty much looking good. I, we've got two choices now. We can either do the armor or the, the tunic. Now, if I was going to be doing the armor with a base coat and then perhaps a, a wash, I think I'd do it now because it would tend to run off and, and seep into these other areas. But the rest of these models were done with a similar sort of triad style in that I just painted the, the base coat for the armor and then went mid and highlight. So under that, on that principle, I'm now going to paint the tunics. Now, these are Etruscan um, where red is quite a big part of their color. So I'm gonna start by taking this Reaper Triad. I'm gonna use the real dark base coat 
to run around and do some work on them. I will be mixing that up with other triads and I'll give you a little bit of a show on those uh, a bit later. But for now, I'm just going to shape the base coat really well, stick it into a receptacle and then come back and we'll start painting. Okay, so I tend to use these little metal trays that you can buy for a few pence and you can actually scrape the paint out once you're finished with it. I've now shaken the base coat. I'm going to put a few drops of that in. Again, if you have a tendency to, to gum up the ends, you can release it with a metal spear. What I'm going to do now is just pick up the trusty brush. Now this is a broken toad brush. Uh, I'm not recommending any particular type. Um, I just happen to like the broken toad. Again, it's about the point that you get, not the size of the brush. So this is a zero, which I find a very useful uh, general all-rounder. Um, as I said, you saw me revert to this for doing the eyes, uh, and now I'm going to use it for the tunic. Um, I think the only thing I would recommend is I've tried artificial bristles, and I just never find them to work very well. So this is a, a sable, Kalinsky sable, and I think you can't go too far wrong if that's your brush of choice. And again, what we're going to do is just take this around the model. Now, this is our base coat, and at this stage, I'm thinking about whether I put an edge to the tunic. If I'm going to do that, I'll obviously leave a little gap here at the bottom so that we um, we have a chance to put that in later. As I said, Etruscans are all about reds. So if I do a highlight, if I do a uh, an edge here, I think it will be a white edge. And there's not much to say about this process other than I don't worry too much on the base coat about whether I'm doing a great deal in terms of coverage. I just want to make sure that I've left enough of an edge there that we can come back and put the tunic line on. And again, I tend to work across the figure, especially when I'm trying to leave a line. And because we've done the painting in this order. Let me just get rid of this. Um, we should minimise the risk of overpainting. But again, if you do overpaint, you know, don't knock yourself out about it. Um, everything can be fixed. So we'll just go up to the top here. Do the same thing here. And for this figure, I'm going to leave a portion at the end of the sleeve as well an off-white I think edge again just a word about horsehair um, plumes blacks whites reds were all reasonable I think you know natural horsehair type color is also fine obviously we're trying to make sure that the figure is historically accurate um, but also something that looks sensible so I'm just going to put a little line around the neck there. And again, because we're going to do the armor later, it doesn't really matter if we um, if we run over that. Probably not much point in doing anything in here. And the beauty of a black undercoat is that as long as you've got the undercoat in the right place, if you can't get a, a section of the model or it just doesn't seem sensible to, to, to paint it like that, well, it's no big deal because the black will just provide extra depth. So I'm not going to labour the point too much with these guys. See if I can do something better with the brush. But um, there's a few in here where we've got a lot of tunic. Let's just do this one here, where we're just going to paint around this one. And this is the only time that you know you need to go a little bit careful about the edging. Again, the strapping here is going to come later. So if you do happen to go over it a little bit, not too much of a problem. And this is one of the few times where you might struggle with the whole inside out tactic because we've actually got a line there for a belt. And um, we need to make sure that we leave that alone. And when we go in there with our brown or whatever color we choose to paint the belts, we don't uh, compromise the red that we've just painted. But I find that once I've done the flesh and the eyes, the difficult job is done. 
this every every time you you revisit the figure now you're actually creating something which is getting closer to the finished article and it for me it just seems that the thing progresses very quickly from this point on okay so we've got sorry if we've got a bit of shadowing here in the camera but hopefully you can see what we're doing um as i said before the black is not perhaps the world's best color uh, for, for the autofocus but what we're doing is just making sure we've got everything that we want covered covered let's come to the top here run over this under here I think reds are one of the few colors where you can jump successfully between triads or uh, you know go from base to highlight and then not feel like you've compromised the, the overall finish uh, again trial and error depends on what types of paint you like uh, and obviously what depth of red or brightness of red you're trying to achieve Anyway, I'm going to carry on finishing those and I'll join you shortly. Hi, welcome back. I realised when I played the video back that the uh, the quality of the focus perhaps wasn't as good as it could be in terms of me getting in the way of the, the actual painting. So I thought what I'd do is take a lighter colour uh, and here I'm going to take the uh, foundry paint. I'm going to take the Boneyard uh, 9. You can see there. Give it a bit of a shake. Then I'm going to take some of the paint and put it into my receptacle here. In fact, I'm probably just going to use it from the lid, to be honest. So let's just do that. Um, and then I'm going to try and just show you the technique. Now, this boneyard is going to end up giving us a bit of an off-white linen-y type effect. I tend to use it more for the lintharax, which we'll cover a bit later. But I just thought here, this is probably going to be a lot easier to see in terms of the, the pigmentation. But what we're doing is going across the figure. And here I'm going to leave, again, a bit of an edge here so that I can have, in this particular case, I'm going to put a red uh, stripe, if you like, or, or banding on the edge of the tunic. This has actually got um, an armoured sort of torso on this figure, and sometimes that can be a little bit challenging when you're using effectively, you know, a goldy, brassy type colour, uh, and you're also going for a bit of an off-white. But um, I do find that it it's not too much of a problem. But hopefully, this is a little bit easier to see. And I tend to be a little bit cautious when I do the first layer, so you can see quite a large band um, at the moment. As I said, if you go over the metal at this stage, because we haven't painted it, it's not a particular problem. And this is giving me a bit of a, almost a watery feel. I think I should have probably stirred it and put some paint into a separate receptacle, but actually, uh, experience tells me this won't be too much of a problem. Let me see if I can go around a little bit and make this band slightly smaller. And again, you know, worst case scenario, if you can't leave an edge, just go up to the end with the with the base coat. So do you know what? I'm, ha I'm happy with that. Just going to make sure that we sort of tuck in just by there, which is where the, the sword is or the scabbard. And again, same sort of principle up here. Uh, hopefully I'm not going to obscure the video too much. And you'll notice there that I've gone over just the top of the, the sword. Uh, and again, this is why we're painting 
um, the inside detail first, as it were, so that if we do uh, run over the top of anything, we know that we haven't painted it yet. We're not ruining it, ruining anything. We're going to go back and, and do it properly a bit later on. And again, if you're going to do a dark color as a as a band or an edging, uh, this isn't really going to matter uh, if you if you don't have such a precise line, because you've got chance to rectify that when we go around the edge. Okay, um, I'm just trying to look at the figure. You can see that we've got pretty good coverage there. Um, you can't easily see any sort of tunic around the neck area. So I'm just going to leave that figure as it is for the time being. So now I'm going to move on, do the rest. I'll probably revert back to a red. And, and what I do with reds is I make sure that I mix up the coloration. Um, I think at this period of history, you know, people would have got tunics with different dyes over different periods in, in time, different ages, if you like. Um, so I'm going to use, you know, quite a variety of things. This is the actual foundry Sort of terracotta style so i'll be using that as well there's a different um triad that i'm going to be using from the the reaper range as well i'll find that out and show you next time so i'm going to go back around all of these miniatures and make sure that i do all the tunics and then give you guys a shout back okay so that's all of the tunics base coated effectively what i've actually done is mix it up a little bit so this group here um i've used the um reaper triad that i showed you earlier which is this bloodstain red starts 133 and runs to a top coat of 935 but i suspect they'll be putting a, a a lighter red on that as well so that's quite a dark finish um which hopefully you can see a little bit on the uh video there behind them i've got here a much brighter red um you can still see you know how sort of the coverage varies a little bit on this base coat and that's fine so this was a triad that i've just i've just literally made up using some vallejo paint so i'm going to try um a, a, a red here a 926 uh which i've i've written base on <laughs> for some reason um then a carmine red a 908 and then i'm going to try a flat red a 957 on top that may be too bright for my taste, but you know we'll probably get away with it um, on these figures. Then these front characters here, um, they've got a Foundry 37A base coat, which is actually a terracotta. Then I've used another Foundry paint, and you can see it's still wet at the moment. This is a Moss. Um, that is a 29 series. Um, and then this is the Boneyard that I showed you earlier. So I'm going to leave those to, to dry properly. I think you've got two choices now. We can either continue on and highlight the base coat or we can go around and start putting edges on. Uh, and I think preferably, my preference would be to put the base coat of the edge on. And I'm going to use predominantly uh, foundry paints again. So I'm going to use a proper white, but I'm going to make sure that we use the 37A just to give us the line, not on all of the um, tunics because in some cases i've not put an edging on but where i have got an edging i think the majority of them will use the um the white and that's because i want to use a slightly different color when i come to paint the lintharax so just for those uninitiated the lintharax uh sorry if i just bring that back looks a little bit like this on the model and what that is it's um composite armor made of different layers of linen strips that were effectively glued together um, and it's formed here into a sort of torso and then you've got the Trujis below that um, and that was actually a very very effective form of light uh, armour um, could be quite time consuming to make but uh, very effective apparently and I think if you look at some modern reenactor um, experiences um, you know they conclude that it was actually very effective the reason I've now grouped these uh, into the different sort of colorations is quite honestly if you get not too much variety between the figures on the base coat it's a really good idea to separate them out like this so you don't lose track and also i like to make sure that there's plenty of variety in the figures 
So again, I've tried to mix up the poses. So yeah, let's let those dry and then we'll start painting the edging colors in. Okay, just to keep things moving along, I'm gonna start with some of the banding on, on the darker figures or the figures with, sorry, darker undercoated uh, red because they've been dry for some time. So again, we're just gonna take the base undercoat, run it along here. Now, I often find if you can engineer it this way, leave a little bit of black between the edging and the tunic color, and it will just create a nice bit of definition. But again, if you go over it, don't worry too much. This is um, still gonna give us an effective finish. And if you do happen to go over the, the tunic too much, you can obviously repaint it with the darker color before we go too far. Um, if you end up going over the flesh or the leg, then again, very easy to repair. And as your sort of practice carries on, you'll, you'll find that your dexterity improves and you'll come up with ways of holding the figure, holding the brush. You'll understand the mix that you want um, in terms of the viscosity of the paint. And this becomes a much easier um, process the more you do, like with most things in life. Um, and we're trying to get a fairly even sort of coloration in, uh, sorry, depth in terms of the actual edging here. And you'll start to see that it's really starting to lift the figure already. And the more you block in, obviously with colors, uh, the more complete the figure appears and the nicer the process feels. And I think for me, one of the beauties of, of painting is that the early stages are quite challenging. You, you know, you don't feel you're getting too far. And then all of a sudden, the figure starts to take shape um, and you can really see where you're going with it. Now, what I'm doing here is just sort of going underneath. I'm not worrying too much about whether I'm covering all of the black because it's literally underneath the figure. But obviously, I don't want any sort of colors um, that shouldn't be there sort of being visible, if that makes sense. Um, so on this particular figure, I've left the top arms as well to have a little bit of banding on. Oops. Getting a little bit of shadowing here, sorry for that. I'm just going to move the figure around. Uh, as I said, slightly more awkward for me here because I'm trying to make sure that you can see what I'm doing. And if you find that you're having a painting session where things aren't going too well, just stop, take a break, recharge the batteries as it were, and go back to it. Um, quite often it's better to do that than persevere if you're just not in the right sort of mode as it were. But uh, do you know what? For the figure that the progress I'm looking to make at the moment, that's absolutely fine. Um, just thought I'd share a little tip in terms of cleaning the brush. Um, obviously I've got a bit more to do, but what I, these are acrylic paints, uh, so they're water soluble. So I've just got myself a, a little jar here with some water in. I tend to give the, uh, the brush a, a wash in, but I, I would thoroughly recommend some brush cleaning soap. Um, now this looks a bit dirty, but what you'll find is when you, when you put that in there and start moving it around, you'll pick up some of that on the brush. And if you get yourself a little tissue, oops, and just wipe it through, you can reform the point quite nicely. And I do find that the, the brush sort of soap does make the brush last a bit longer. But I'm going to carry on doing some edging and, and then give you guys a look at what that's done to the overall effect. Welcome back. So I finished putting on some edging on most of the tunics as we uh, described a short, uh, short while ago. <clears throat> I've also put some red edging on some of the lighter or what will end up being lighter colored tunics. I'm going to stop there because I've now done one color of the red and it will just make life a lot easier when I start to um, come and put some mid coats in that I know which ones have got 
which types of red on because on the darker side you can sometimes get confused what i'm now going to do um because i think it will make rendering on the video a lot better if for no other reason is i'm going to pick some of the figures that have got um <coughs> the, the, the sandals or footwear and i'm going to take uh, a brown and try and <coughs> highlight uh, well effectively run the brush over so that we pull out some of those strands and make it look like um uh, you know that they've, they've actually got some sandals on the reason i'm going to do that now is again using this whole sort of principle that we're painting things that we don't want to overpaint later if i do that now then i can go inside and do the base um, and i think once i've got that not being so black it makes the figure look better and you sort of get a hit in terms of <clears throat> understanding how much progress you're making with the figure but also i think it will really help the video so when I base figures, um, I always start with an undercoat, which, sorry, if I turn that the right way around, which is a Vallejo English uniform. I find this quite a, a, a sort of palette, if you like, or a, something which provides a really good basing. You can either go darker if you want. You can, you can certainly go highlight a, a, light, a lighter color. But I think this, for me, for the majority of my figures, this works really well. And we'll show you what I do. Um, on, you know once the figures are actually prepped and we're putting them on bases but i tend to put like a sand mix on top so it will naturally lighten um, and that's a really good base so what i want to do is make sure that there's enough difference between that color and the color that we're going to choose for these sandals so i did talk about this triad that i've used before um which is based on again some vallejo colors which is this 822 uh, a 984 and if possible if we need it an 846 but i think if you look at those colors you'll notice that they're going to give us a very different feel to the stuff that's going to be or to the color that's going to be put around the base so i'm going to start by using the very dark color to edge edge round uh, and i'll show you what that looks like once i've given this a shake put some into a container and then we'll do a little bit of a show and tell in terms of painting some of the sandals Okay, so again, I've put a slightly thicker mix in terms of the paint in this uh, receptacle here. And it's obviously very dark brown. Now, depending on which, which way I've got the figure aligned, um, I, I usually run around the bottom edge like this, just to create the general impression that they've got um, effectively a base to the, to the sandal. So just, just to warm us up, we'll do that around here. Um, and obviously we're going to go around the edge with our base coat if you find that you've got quite a bit of the black still showing if you remember i just put enough flesh on to make it look like there was the general impression of skin underneath the uh, sandal but then what I'm, i tend to do is just put some drag drag the brush across the top um, depending on how good the figure is there will be effectively the straps modeled on the figure and obviously if you can pick those out then great happy days but sometimes they're very close together and actually if we're trying to get a, a distinct sort of visual effect that will last on the distances that you have on the tabletop then you know you can get away with being fairly rough about this to be quite honest remember this is this is the dark coat and actually do you know what already we're creating the impression that this is a sandal just make sure we get under under the foot here and because it is quite dark um when we as i say when i go around <coughs> and do the do the base that's not going to be a problem at all not all of these models have um sandals uh, depending on the on the on the nationality if you like or the city state uh these were either favored or not um, the human foot gets very tough if you don't wear footwear And in many cases in history 
uh, you know, should we say less advanced armies have, have certainly been happy to go without structured footwear. And if you've got like quite tight sandals where you're creating a, a strapping over the top like that, that's absolutely fine. I'm, I'm, I'm still happy with that. We're going to put some light lightning on a bit later on. All we're trying not to do is lose the underlying impression that that we've got a foot in there somewhere. Okay, so that's good enough for me. We've got a batch of figures here that have all got footwear. I don't know if you can see too clearly on the video, but this one is is much more about a whole piece actually. Um, so there's a there's a very definite structure in terms of fitting other than the front toes on this particular design and as i say just a reminder these are etruscans but the same influences the same footwear if you like was common throughout the mediterranean and sandals are pretty um time proof in terms of you know the same types of footwear would have persisted all the way through certainly through the Roman Empire period and beyond. Let's just make sure we're creating enough of an impression here that we know that this chap has got some footwear. OK, so hopefully let me just make sure. But again, you see this this figure here. No need. We haven't actually got any uh, sandals on this guy. We'll just do this one as the last one in the batch just to make sure you get a good view and hopefully see what i'm doing i'm going to do it a bit cack handed just to run through there on that edge run through the toe area but trying to go below the toe as much as we can again if you think that you haven't done this too well a bit later on we can come back and put a blob of flesh back over the top will be all good again obviously this one's got greaves so let me just get in there a little bit Ooh. surprisingly difficult just to hold the figure away from you actually there you go so let's try this one here. Not done too much flesh there, so I think we'll be making this one more of a, a filled in sandal, as it were. Just for a bit of balance, I'm going to put the thickness in there. It's fine. Okay, and we'll get some lightning on that. Hopefully, that's uh, been fairly okay with the camera. So, I'm just going to run around some of these other models, excuse me, finish off uh, the footwear, and then come back. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to move on to painting the base color. As I said before, that's an English uniform for me. Um, obviously, depending on how you want to finish the base will depend on how, you know, your choice of colour, etc. Um, all I would say is, you know, the tip I gave about making sure that the colour on the, on the footwear or the sandals doesn't, you know, too closely match the base colour, I th still think is a good idea. I'm just going to put a small amount in here, give it a bit of a mix. English uniform is a very good coverer, tends to be a bit uh, sticky, so it will happily take a little bit of water to, to liven it up. Um, I think, to be honest, this is one of my favourite parts about painting the figure, because all of a sudden um, we, we create the definition of, of our figure as opposed to the base. Um, sorry, let me just see if we can get in here a bit better. Not sure if that's creating more shadow or not so apologies for that as you can see what we're doing is just 
creating running around the edge and just getting rid of that, that black undercoat just following the line around the figure and obviously it doesn't really matter if you leave a little bit of a line between the base and the but where is it where sorry hopefully you can see this while I'm working so we can move that around a bit this way maybe let's have a look yeah so what we're doing here is obviously just going around all the areas of the base on this temporary sort of piece of card that I talked about ages ago. Just making sure, and you don't have to be too precise about this, as I say, leaving a bit of a, uh, a bit of um, space around is absolutely fine because we're going to go back and do a proper basing job on this. But now, now for me, um, as I said, I really like this because all of a sudden we've got a figure. Yeah. Um, it's sort of we're doing the base immediately lifts out the figure and we can really see what we're doing. Now there will be, will be times when we're going quite uh, into a narrow gap, should we say, between the feet. Uh, so you can switch to a, a thinner brush. I'm using a, an older brush here, which is slightly wider, but it's still good enough to do this job. And as I say, this is a, I really like this stage of the painting. Uh, just, I don't know what you guys are seeing on the video, but for me, this is really starting to pick out the figure. And uh, I'm quite happy with progress so far. So for me, I'm just going to carry on running around these guys now. There. And um, I'll come back when I've done it all. See you shortly.